Are you ready for some Jersey? Well, we've got Jersey. The zipper was made here. The light bulb was made here. The color television calls the Garden State home. Everybody wants to know about New Jersey. Sandy beaches, beautiful cities. We even have the Jersey Turnpike. Inventors, music, the movies. You need an exit? We got them too. You want Jersey? This is Jersey. Are you ready for some Jersey? Well, we've got Jersey. The zipper was made here. The light bulb was made here. The color television calls the Garden State home. Everybody wants to know about New Jersey. Sandy beaches, beautiful cities. We even have the Jersey Turnpike. Inventors, music, the movies. You need an exit? We got them too. You want Jersey? This is Jersey. Welcome to this edition of This Is Jersey. We're here with Melba Moore, a legendary R&B recording artist who has just released her newest album, Forevermore. This Jersey girl is a four-time Grammy nominee, Tony Award winner, and a Billboard chart topper. She has sung for numerous movie soundtracks on late night television and on the Broadway stage. We caught up with her recently just outside of New York City to talk about her life, her music, and her achievements. So, Melba, you started when you were about 10 years old. Mom got you involved with music. Tell me about that. Well, actually, no, Mom didn't. She married my stepfather, who was a piano player. He's 100 years old, and he's still playing. Yeah. So he made us all take piano lessons. Yeah, and he forced <laughs> the siblings and everybody to do that, right? Yes, and we all fell in love with music, and all of us sing and play. I'm the only one that now is professional, but music became the centerpiece of our lives uh -huh. at that time. And in reference to your mom performing and being an artist, uh, how did she influence you? Oh, tremendously. She was my idol. She was glamorous. She was always saying, you have to look nice all the time and you have to be a lady. And, you know, and she really aspired to the glamour part of uh, being an artist as well as she always used to tell me, you know, I don't care how much you study music, you have to move people's hearts. And she's the one who really gave me kind of the guidelines to to having a passion for being an artist. So, but my mother married um, my stepfather. We moved to Newark, New Jersey. He had a son and a daughter. So now I had a family. I had music lessons. Um, um, we went to church. You know, I had a whole, um, I had a whole family, a whole um, life. Mm -hmm. So that's when all of the uh, formal institution of music really came into our lives. We studied piano at home. By the time I got to uh, high school, I knew I wanted to be in the arts, so I went to the Music and Art um, School of Performance. I majored in music education in college. You know, then I was, I was sucked in. <laughs> it was over. So even in high school, um, did you perform with other Newark artists? I mean, a lot of artists have come out of Newark. Any? Oh, well, and a lot of artists started when they were in high school, but I didn't. I just performed in high school, and I performed in college. And then after that, I. Um, taught school in the uh, public schools. Yes, you were but a teacher first. I was a, yeah, I was a music educator, but I told my father especially that um, I didn't want to teach school anymore because it was really what they wanted me to do. And I needed to see if I could be an artist. And he started to take me around to some of his colleagues to see if he could help me get into the industry. So yeah, I kind of started after college. That's pretty late. As an African-American woman, was it difficult back then? Uh, no, uh, not to be an artist. Everybody knew we could sing and dance and we had rhythm. <laughs> uh -huh. But to uh, break some of the ceilings and barriers, yes. I mean, Broadway was certainly not really just wide open to African Americans, but I happened to be at the right place at the right time with a bunch of hippies who didn't care what color you were, or even if you could act. <laughs> If you had an interesting personality, they said, come on and sing for the director and the producer. And that's how I got my first Broadway show, uh, That's hair, hair, hair right. <laughs> could could so, you guess it was hair? Yeah, right. So t tell me about that experience in the audition. Uh, well, it wasn't really an audition. Um, I met Valerie Simpson. She got me into background work, uh, studio singing. And one of the recording sessions was for Galt McDermott. He wrote the music for the Broadway musical Hair. And when it was finished, um, Jim and Jerry, uh, who were the stars of the play and the, and the writers of the uh, book and the lyrics, asked us to come down and sing for the director and the producers because they were still casting for strong black singers. So kind of by accident, I, I got into my first Broadway show. And how long were you in the show? I was in for a year and a half, and by the time I left, I was doing the female lead, and I, I wound up being the first black actress to replace a white actress because I wound up replacing Diane Keaton, yeah, Diane as it turned out. Yeah. 
do you have a relationship with her over the years? Not now. Not now, but back then you back did. Then we so after hair finished up, then what did you do after that? Well, I didn't have a, 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 a manager or agent, but one of the girls told me about auditions for the Broadway show Pearly. And I was going to go and start trying to learn how to audition, but I got the part. <laughs> and um, of course, the, uh, the role was Ludie Bell, Gussie Mae Jenkins, which guarded me the role of, guarded me uh, Best Supporting Actress in yeah. a Musical, uh -huh. Tony, Tony Award. Tony Award, yeah. yeah. And with that came so many other accolades throughout your career after well, that? Well, then I was invited back into the recording industry, but as a lead singer. Now, we're, you're still now in your 20s, right, at this yeah. point? Yeah. As a lead singer. So tell me, how did you get into the record business now that uh, you had your, your Well, once Tony I got my Tony Award, Award and I was plastered all over the newspapers and on television and everywhere, I began to get offers uh, <clears throat> for recording contracts. Then I got agents and I got managers and I got signed to, um, I think it was Mercury Records was the first label and did my first album, which was called I Got Love, of course, uh, reminding people of the song in the Broadway show and included it on the first album. And that was my entree back into the recording industry, but as a lead singer. So when did you find out you were going to the Tony Awards and maybe win? That was 1970. I can't tell you the day. I've had too many other events. But I did find out, and um, I don't know if you know who George Faison is, but he directed The Wiz. But at that time, he was in the chorus of uh, Pearly. And he said, Melba, you have to have a formal dress. And I didn't have one. So he made me one. He was doing sewing on the side right. to make a few extra dollars. and. Um, um, I performed I Got Love in the uh, Tony Awards. And That's all over the internet. It's on I, YouTube and everything. I, right? Yeah, well, I don't remember it. I have to watch it because it was too <laughs> exciting. I remember the stage turned around. I said, oh my God, I'm going to die up here. <laughs> And the lights were on instead of being off. It was just a bizarre um, uh, experience. And then when they call the categories, they call someone else's first name and my, my last name. Melissa Moore and Pearlie. So I was trying to get out of there. And they said, no, Melba, Melba. I heard the audience. I said, oh my God, what did I do? I mean, it was just crazy because I didn't understand the categories. And then they said, it's Melba Moore. And from there on, I said something, but I don't remember <laughs> what I said. In other words, it was very exciting. And then after parties and everything like that, you were oh, around yeah. people who you look up to over the years? Absolutely. It was just amazing. Uh, they went to Sardis and, you know, just standing there gawking at everybody, trying to say, well, where am I? What, what has happened? I just was trying to get the part. <laughs> so you got it all right, honey. We're going to take a break now. We come back. I want to continue your career, specifically your recording career. We'll do that when we come back. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to This is Jersey. We're here with Melba Moore, who's going to talk to us about her experience in the music industry and her new album. So Melba, you win the Tony Award, and then you decide to go out on your own creating albums. What was it like in the early 70s, putting albums out and performing that way? Um, <clears throat> well... It was wonderful and it was interesting, but it was very confusing because there was really nobody guiding and leading my career. So I was always kind of guessing and trying to figure out what was going to be my singing style, what kind of music should I put out. I was an African-American. Now I'm going into the recording industry, but as a Broadway artist. And at that time, that didn't exist. Uh -huh. So basically trying to find a manager was impossible because they said, well, you're Broadway, so you can't sing. R&B, because if you were black and you were going to do music, you had to sing R&B music. Uh -huh. And so that was a great challenge. I mean, I found management and I started to uh, do music, but we really had to have a, um, a good, I had good management in, in my ex-husband. Uh -huh. he, he really did that very well because mm -hmm. he, he had to find the right songwriters, producers, and the right music that would appeal, first of all, to um, white audiences, but not lose my black audience right. oh well she's left us that right, was right. That, that was a challenge now there were others like gloria gaynor and dion warwick did you have relationships with them as well no i mean i sang backup in the studio for them oh you did but i didn't have relationships with them in reference to then that first album coming out um what was that like and going on tour and that sort of thing first album was i got love and i think there was a couple after that 
and one of them was Living to Give, but I didn't have uh, tours for that yet. It wasn't until later on in 1978 or around there when I had you stepped into my life. I was married, I had a family, I had a management team. Then we had promotional tours, we had the Meet Melba campaigns, we had a record company. Um, then I think it was um, Epic Records that actually had a promotional team and were planning these things. So now I was beginning to actually have a career. <laughs> okay. And you were building that for many years. You know, you yes. started to sing and then you came to that point in your career. What was it like now? How many children did you have at that point? I only have one daughter, but I mean my whole family, like, you know, um, brothers in laws and, you know, uh -huh. aunts, uh, everything. <laughs> right. So after those, that album was released, what happened next throughout the 80s? You're still recording? Still recording. Then I took off. <laughs> then I have songs like Love's Coming At You, um, Falling, and a duet with Freddie Jackson, uh, um, just a little bit more, uh, just a whole series. I was beginning to have a recording career, and I still re reap the benefits of that now. Uh -huh. yeah. After reviewing the album and some of the songs that are on there, a lot of the songs are very inspirational. Tell me about the purpose of the album. The purpose of the album is to be a hit record, of course. But it's also autobiographical, and it kind of um, says, um, it's my time again. I, I can smile again. I, I really want to fly again. I mean, the, the lyrics are very strong in that way, and it shows off my, my uh, range once again to show the people I still have it, and um, I still have this energy. So that's kind of the message. And we've got some really beautiful um, just good, strong, urban, contemporary R&B style music. Good boom, boom, boom beats. Uh -huh. Things you want to dance to. They call it, they call it Stephen music, you know. <laughs> and so it's, it's really feeling good. And that's my story too. I feel great. I feel like I'm doing great. I look great. And you can too. That's my story. <laughs> Tell us about some of the people you worked with on the album. Anyone that strikes a chord with our viewers? Um, no, these are all new people. Um, Dennis Johnson and Reagan Johnson and Zoea uh, <clears throat> wrote It's My Time Again. Um, uh, George and Angela Pettis wrote How Sweet It Is, um, Less Dance, Forevermore. Uh, one of the lyrics says, I'm not just a memory, I'm forevermore. <laughs> and they're, they're new artists, and I felt like I needed to have some fresh air and fresh breath in my music. But the music is very, um, it's, it's contemporary, but it's based on solid classic R&B music. So we didn't try to go off into the deep end or anything. We really tried to be organic, synergetic, make you feel something. Then you would say, oh, well, who is that? You know, not like, this is Melba Moore. Right. No, this is for you. This is for you to move and dance. And I've already tried to prove over the years, especially that I didn't have hit music out to promote me, that I, I can sing and you know, so whoever have an opportunity, I give you my best, I do my best drama, I do my best ranges and everything. But some of this is just to make sure that you feel good. And then you say, wait a minute, she can sing too. Almost like a reinvention of yourself. Yes. Promoting music today is much different than it was in the 70s. How are you working with this industry that's a little difficult? No, I'm finding because I have a really good manager. <laughs> That's first of all, if you don't have good business or a good team, it doesn't matter how much um, talent you have or how great the song is, nobody will get to hear it or see it. So he's really great at, he's mastered the social networking media. And in some ways, it's really, really so much better than it was because you can post your information out on social media to one person. And if, if it's the right person, you can hit thousands. That's how it's changed in a good way. Who has come out of the closet to help you in this endeavor? Oh, I, I can't tell you the, the people have come out. That's one of the other things, too, that with a social media, if somebody likes it, um, they'll promote you on their site. And there have been just so many. So that's why I have such great hope for great and um, widespread success of it, because the people who like it, they're telling everybody about it, you know, besides our promoting it ourselves. Right. What about music videos? Do you have a music video out with this album? We have one coming uh, for a Less Dance, because everybody likes that one. On the, I guess because it's summer and they're having the cookouts and the boat rides and everybody's, oh, I gotta have this song. I'm gonna be doing my thing on this song. So we're gonna start with that one. I'm also getting ready to uh, tour my one woman play with music. 
And so as we move around the country, you'll, you'll be seeing that. But the first thing to do, since I believe music is my anointing, it's not that I sing so great, but I got good well, luck there. I would disagree with that. I got good luck there. <laughs> and so I, don't, I want that to be the centerpiece because always traditionally, if I sang well and was in the right place at the right time, I got Broadway, I got television, I got everything out of that. So I'm hoping that's the way it'll happen this way too. Now you had your own show there for a while. What was that experience I've like? I've had a couple of shows. What was it like? Well, television is very difficult. It's hours and hours and hours of doing, it's like filming, it's the same thing. And um, <clears throat> with comedy, which is what we were, um, you, you have to try to guess that it's gonna be funny and all that, so it's, it's very difficult. But our show was a summer replacement show, the Melbourne Moore Clifton Davis show, uh, and it replaced the Carol Burnett show. So it wasn't very long, but I think it was very successful because people still remember it, they still replay it. But again, um, Clifton nor I had management at the time, so the fact that we even got the show in the first place was quite a miracle. Now you're based in New Jersey now. Um, what's it like to be so close to New York, and what are your roots in Newark? Well, I planned it that way, because I do everything in New York, but then I come and take a breath of air <laughs> in Jersey. Uh, my roots in Newark are that I still have um, colleagues in business and community service work there, and um, friends that I went to school with, so I'm, it's still like home. It's not, it's not my base, but it's my home. Melba, you're one of many New Jersey artists. Do you have relationships with any of the others that grew up with you, Dionne Warwick, uh, Sissy Houston, that sort of thing? Yes, well, Dr. Houston, matter of fact, her church, New Hope, I had my daughter baptized there. So we have those kind of uh, religious uh, ties. Uh, Dion and I are good friends. We've done a lot, a lot of good uh, community service work. She sang on my Lift Every Voice and Sing recording, which is entered into the congressional record. Leslie Uggams, Dion, and I are going to do like a Q&A session at the Apollo Theater in October. And we're all going to be glammed down like we used to be. All right. <laughs> Do you have any performances scheduled with the, uh, with the new album? We're going to be doing lots of CD release parties on uh, Forevermore. So just uh, kind of keep your eyes and ears open for us to uh, be in your neighborhoods celebrating Forevermore, because I'll be performing live in very intimate audiences. So in your most recent CD release party at Duke Southern Table, you had a big party. Tell me about that. The first launching release party was at Duke's restaurant in uh, Newark, New so Jersey. Grateful and charmed that you have come and blessed us 50 years in the business and still looking fabulous. What do you owe that longevity to, Lady Melba? Hard work. <laughs> hard work. We had red carpet. It was just outrageous. Uh, Ladies of Sky came and helped me celebrate. And it, it was just full. We had beautiful dinner and hors d'oeuvres. And everybody just loved the music. It was just absolutely fabulous. So we decided to have all of our release parties at just small gatherings so that we could feel like we're uh, intimate and we can get to know each other and speak with each other and, and, and uh, spend time with each other as well as you know buy the CD and all of that. So. How can viewers find out about you? Oh, okay, well you can see me on melbourne.com, my website, Instagram, Facebook, I think I'm melbourne number one. Oh, that's a great way to find out about us. Melba, thank you so much for being on our show. Good luck in all that you do. Forevermore is the album. Be sure to check it out on the internet, iTunes, and anywhere else you can find music.